In today's video, we'll be learning about how to combat fat phobia by reminding ourselves that someone's weight is simply none of your business. Then we'll take a dive into the issue of free speech on the average American campus by asking ourselves, do college students hate free speech? Timestamps are in the description box below. Gender is a universe. All white people benefit from racism. The health problems I have are more age-related than weight-related. You are a white privileged male. That's just a not so you, you have to give me a chance to respond to that. And we don't care. Care. Hey, look at me. Look at this tum. I ain't do this for no good reason. You gon' look at this tum. Do I have to? Do I really have to? So here are some of my weird thoughts and the things that I've like gone through when I've been in public just being fat and living my life and eating. Did you guys hear that? That was the chair. I did not fart. I do not fart in public. Ladies do not fart. That was the chair. Sure, Jan. Oh my god, that dude's staring at me. Why is he staring at me? Ooh, that cheeseburger look real good. I'm not gonna eat a cheeseburger in front of all of these. Why is he still staring at me? Do I have something on my face? Is my boob out? Just the left one? What is happening? Oh yeah, no, I'll take the um grapefruit. I'm just gonna eat delicately like a lady. How do skinny ladies eat? Just like... Dun, dun, dun. Oh my God, this is so good. It's so fresh. Recently, The Guardian published a special article entitled Diet Advice and Tiny Seats, How to Avoid 10 Forms of Fat Phobia, and they give us this helpful list. Step number one, avoid saying phrases such as, wow, haven't you lost weight? Because when we stop using this kind of language altogether, we create an environment in which people of all sizes can coexist without a sense of weight surveillance. Step number two, avoid selfies taken from above. Try documenting yourself at different angles. Step number three, avoid tiny seats in restaurants. If you're going to dinner with a fat friend, check images of the restaurant's interior to make sure there are sturdy chairs without armrests and non-stationary tables and chairs if cramped booths are the main seating option. Because the restrictive size of seating is what's called structural fat phobia. Step number four, avoid romantic discrimination. Step number five, remember to interrupt instances of bigotry whenever you see it on public transport and planes. Step number six, remember that Professional and formal wear do not come in plus size. Step number seven, overcome fashion double standards. Step number eight, overcome the fear of being seen in public with fat people. Step number nine, avoid giving unsolicited weight loss advice. Fat people have tried every kind of diet. This kind of advice only makes us feel alienated. Step number 10, remember to call out all instances of medical discrimination. It has to stop for everyone's sake. Oh my god, this is so satisfying. You guys heard that, right? That was definitely the chair. Sure, Jan. So those are some of the thoughts that I used to have when I would go out um, to eat with friends. And the, here are some of the thoughts that I have now when I go out and I'm eating with my buds. <laughs> my chair sounds like it's farting. Do you guys hear that? <laughs> oh, hey, yeah, hi, thank you so much. Can we please get another round of mimosas? That sounds dope. Also, can I try the scotch eggs? Because I've always wanted to try one since Kevin from the office was just shoving them in his face. Oh, you guys want to get dessert? No, I'm getting my own. No, 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 no. I'm not sharing. It's one cookie. What are we going to do? Break one cookie into 12 parts? Yeah, another round of mimosas. That sounds dope. Why is that dude staring at us? Hey! Hey, you. Hey. Hey, buddy. Hey. Pay attention to your food. Pay attention. I will come over there. Put it away, Red Rocket. Another interesting article is this one published by Blood and Milk called I Wish My New Partner Wasn't Overweight. How Do I Combat My Fat Phobia? Anonymous asks, do you have any advice or resources to help me further combat my fat phobia in the context of a new relationship? I want to get over the most subconscious thoughts and feelings about my partner being a bit overweight that might undermine the success of our unfolding relationship. I guess I'm questioning how much should I trust my natural attraction versus challenge this assessment knowing it's biased and based on social gender constructs. Blood and Milk responds, Anonymous, thank you for your courage in asking this question and being willing to do the work around your fat phobia. Awareness and reaching out are great first steps. Blood and Milk then goes on to say that we all have implicit biases, even if they may not align with our conscious beliefs. They say that we should forgive ourselves for our false beliefs about fatness. They also suggest working with someone to combat your fat phobia. They also say that we should change what we see by filling our feeds with fat-affirming, healthier every size and anti-diet media. The magazine goes on to say that I've sprinkled resources 
used throughout this article, but here are some additional faves. For example, blogs such as Chubster, and when you go on Chubster you're greeted by this... <laughs> <laughs> this article about the best face masks for big heads with I have no idea why he's on a face mask, but okay. Uh, is Amerisleep's AS2 hybrid the best mattress for heavy people? And Heavy Conversation, the best big and tall shorts for spring and summer. Fascinating. Anyone who's sitting there and taking time out of their day to judge you is kind of not a great person. Because a lot of times the people that are sitting around judging you are doing it because they're real sad inside and they need to feel like someone is lower than them so that they don't feel as low as they feel in their hearts. Sure, Jan. Occidental College in California is considering instituting a system for students to report so-called microaggressions perpetrated against them on campus. Microaggressions are statements that intentionally or unintentionally send a negative message related to someone's membership in a marginalized group. Thankfully, our favorite online publication Vox has a useful article which tells us what to do if you want to avoid subjecting people to microaggressions. In short, make an effort. It's not very hard to put some thought into the biases you might hold, become curious curious about the way your words and actions are perceived by others, listen when people explain why certain remarks offend them, and make it a habit to stop for a beat and think before you speak, especially when you're weighing in on someone's identity. In his video on microaggressions, Su- Su? His? Okay, never mind. Offered five suggestions for things individuals can do to avoid them. One, be constantly vigilant of your own biases and fears. Two, seek out interaction with people who differ from you in terms of race, culture, ethnicity, and other qualities. Three, don't be defensive. Four, be open to discussing your one attitudes and biases and how they might have hurt others or in some sense revealed bias on your part. Five, be an ally by standing personally against all forms of bias and discrimination. Bonus tip, peruse the many examples Examples of microaggressions that have been chronicled in articles, in academic research, and using social media. Once you hear about how they affect people, chances are you will be more aware of what they look like, and suddenly much less likely to repeat them. Have you heard of the term microaggression? Yeah, that's a big thing on campus. If we see large-scale violence, we can name that as a macroaggression. But the way that we devalue that violence, the way that we silence that violence, that's a microaggression. I'm asking an Asian American, where were you born? Yes. Very, very contextual, you know? That's not a microaggression, that's just asking where they were born. Telling a black student that he or she is very articulate. That is, yeah. Yes. What about saying all lives matter? Um, I think because the history behind Black Lives Matter, it's kind of like um, appropriating a statement that was created specifically to talk about um, black lives being lost to police brutality, so that is. Thankfully, the New York Times also has a helpful guide on how to deal with microaggressions, and microaggressions deserve micro-interventions, and this is how you disarm a microaggression. Even once you've decided that you can respond to a microaggression, knowing what to say or how to behave can be nerve-wracking. In his research on disarming microaggressions, Dr. Sue uses the term micro-intervention to describe the process of confronting a microaggression. Unless adequately armed with strategies, microaggressions may occur so quickly they are oftentimes over before a counteracting response can be made, he said. While your response will vary by situation, context and relationship, Dr. Goodman recommends memorizing these three tactics from her list of prepared statements. Statement number one, ask for more clarification. Statement number two, separate intent from impact. Statement number three, share your own process. I'm colorblind, I don't see race. Um. Possibly? <laughs> I believe the most qualified person should get the job. Qualifications aren't really the only, the only thing you should consider when hiring someone. If you're saying that the most qualified person is someone who is not a minority, you're not of a religion you believe in, then yes, that'd be a microaggression. Nor, now, here's a radical thought. How about hiring someone that's qualified and well-suited to the role, rather than simply hiring the wrong person for the sake of diversity and being inclusive? It's a stretch, I know, but I may be onto something. Saying God bless you after somebody sneezes. Oh, that would be a microaggression because of different religions. Yeah, it could be a microaggression to someone who doesn't believe in God. Do you see any downside to creating a database full of statements that faculty and students make to each other in terms of protecting free speech values on campus? Not in terms of protecting free speech value, but the idea of a database certainly raises eyebrows. So yes, we do need a system where we can report our experiences and that like a system of 
um, education or whatever. I would say it's good to have it in place, but to have like harsh accents against it, it wouldn't be beneficial to student life here. It'll make a safer environment. So I fully support the council and I think it's really great that the faculty is taking this initiative. Well, unfortunately, microaggressions can also occur in the workplace. Forbes writes, So what does a microaggression look like in action? After doing some research, it appears that it often falls into either one of two camps. Biased actions that feel discriminatory, as mentioned in the report above, and comments that signal, at best, insensitivity and, at worst, derogatory views. A common thread that seemed to run through them all was that of stereotypical or derogatory views. Women in general being hormonal is one example. Women of an ethnic minority being poster people for an entire race is another. The question we all need to ask ourselves before making a comment that might cause offence in the first place is, does the race, gender or sexual orientation of this person have any impact of the work we are doing in this moment or the conversation we are having? And if it does, is my comment respectful or presumptuous? As the women in the workplace report reflects, microaggressions can seem small when dealt with one by one, but when repeated over time they can have a major impact. The resulting repercussion is that women who experience these microaggressions are three times more likely to regularly think about leaving, meaning the impact for businesses goes far beyond just the relationships within them. This is something to consider when next conversing with a colleague who differs from ourselves.